Thank you for coming to the uh, BSD panel uh, for, for the Phoenix Linux user group. Um, I want to start off by introducing our panelists. Uh, on your left, we have uh, Kevin Bowling. Uh, Kevin is a uh, system administrator and developer for Limelight Networks. Uh, he works on a wide variety, variety of Unix implementations. Uh, one of the things he's doing is FreeBSD. Uh, over at Limelight, we have uh, tens of thousands of FreeBSD boxes. So he's working on scaling and, uh, the, the, the cluster and working on our footprint because we want the OS using less resources so that the applications and the, and the services can use most of the resources on the system. On your right, uh, we have uh, Darren. Darren has been uh, developing for more than uh, 25 years. Uh, the most recent uh, position was over at the Lunar Renaissance Orbiter NASA mission over at ASU, so here in, uh, in Tempe. Uh, and he's also been a longtime user of OpenBSD and FreeBSD. And he actually used to run a BSD group here in town um, when he had more free time, I think, than he has nowadays. Um, so I, I want to thank him also for the work that he's done in the community over the years. All right. Okay, so I will, I've done the, the intro, but I want to give each of them a chance to talk about uh, the particular variety of BSD that they're kind of representing tonight, um, but they might be able to take, they can take questions about multiple versions. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with Kevin again. Okay, um, so I'll be talking primarily about FreeBSD, um, but I have some knowledge of derivatives. Uh, there's a number of appliances that you might have heard of, um, FreeNAS, uh, PFSense, things like that. I can... Uh, I'll gladly talk about, um, and I can also talk about why FreeBSD makes a good choice to make uh, appliances like that. There's a lot of uh, interesting things that um, are possible with by using FreeBSD as a toolkit. Um, yeah, well, OpenBSD, because security matters. And uh, OpenBSD is often thought of in terms of security, but it's also a fully functional OS that does a lot of the things you'd expect out of a Unix-like operating system. I've used it for um, many years as desktop. I've used it on laptops. Um, I put it on little, uh, you know, I have a, Gosh, now I can't remember the name of that. It's a little tiny board with like four uh, network things and, uh, you know, four network ports. I've used it on that. It has like a wireless access point and firewall. Um, used it for a lot of different things. So. I want to start off by asking about uh, BSD and embedded uh, projects because I know there are a lot of things that even I'm not familiar with. Um, and uh, Kevin, you specifically talked about OpenNAS. Um, and everything. So, w could you give an example of two or three open uh, embedded product, product projects, and then also maybe a little bit more in depth uh, information about one? Yeah. So, so FreeBSD, the the common ones in the open source ecosystem are PFSense, which is a router, uh, a firewall and router distribution. You can put this on um, just a standard PC with multiple NICs or uh, specialized hardware that. Uh, it has lower power and like mini PCI slots, so you can put Wi-Fi cards in it. Um, FreeNAS is a storage appliance. Um, it uses ZFS to give you really nice file system features like snapshots and data checksums. Um, and you can export that to uh, Samba for Windows computers. Uh, Apple or uh, NFS. Um, it can also do block storage like iSCSI uh, to other systems. Um, interestingly enough, uh, FreeBSD is also used by a lot of corporations. So um, if you've ever worked on a, net, a NetApp, uh, this is like an enterprise storage appliance. That's FreeBSD. Um, a number of load balancers use FreeBSD underneath. Um, uh, some of F5's products do. Uh, Cisco and, uh, sells a number of uh, spam firewalls. Um, pretty much anything coming out of Juniper is running FreeBSD. They're very, uh, very um, talented in, in using FreeBSD to, to do different things. Um, and they're also active in developing the, the upstream project. 
Okay. And then uh, on for the other side of the table, uh, asked Darren about a couple of the projects there. Um, my one of my favorite projects of all time, but it's definitely coming out of the BSD world, is OpenSSH. Um, but something a little bit more relevant uh, right now uh, to what has been going on in security in the last uh, year and should have been going on for several years uh, is LibreSSL. Um, so would you talk about the security focus of OpenBSD and some of the projects that have come out of that? Yeah, um, obviously security is a very important thing to OpenBSD. Um, I, there's an interesting way that they look at it um, which is that security flaws are bugs. And the higher quality your software is, the fewer bugs you have, the fewer security problems that you have. So rather than just being like, jump on and patch all the security problems, it's a very, you know, thorough, holistic view involving like code auditing and all this other stuff that goes on that doesn't necessarily produce immediate results. It instead it really, you know comes about through higher quality. When they took on the Lib Libra SSL thing, um, you know that's not something they did lightly. They didn't do it lightly with OpenSSH. Um, with OpenSSH, they felt they just had no choice due to the licensing issues with the original SSH. With OpenSSL, they f they just figured we can't let this go on like this, and the people who are doing it are now doing some of the things they should have been doing all along, which is great, but still it's the same people who got us into kind of a messy situation. So they wanted to provide an alternative um, with that kind of holistic quality backed security focus that brings you things like OpenSSH, which everyone uses, and problems are very few and far between. It's very reliable, very secure. So I think even if you don't want to use that, I think having alternatives out there is going to be a good thing. If you do want to use it, I think, uh, you know, it's a very... It's becoming more and more viable as a drop-in replacement for, you know, for the TLS layer and things like that. And it's all open source, so hopefully if there's a bug fix somewhere, it'll spread around. Now, I think that both of uh, FreeBSD and OpenBSD have the, the next in common. Um, so this is a Linux user group. We are... Uh, in favor of free software in general and different ty ty types of Unix. Uh, so I'm glad we have some BSD content um, because we don't get enough of that coming in. Um, but uh, we do have a primary focus within our group on uh, Linux distributions. Uh, most of those that we use have package management. We are using package management. Um, but BSD has a port system. Um, so could you, one of you explain what the port system is and maybe give some reference in comparison contrast to, to package management and whether or not package management is available with the port system. Yeah, I think both of us probably need to talk about this because they've diverged quite a lot. Okay. Um, so FreeBSD traditionally has uh, had this thing called ports and it's basically recipes for building software off the internet. Um, there, it, it, it's make files. If you've ever seen a make file, uh, they've written a lot of porcelain around this that can go out and fetch the source. It'll check some it, extract it, um, run different options to pass to configure. And uh, the net result of that is actually a package. Um, it's important to note that most Linux distributions are doing the same thing. It's just hidden from the users. Um, for example, Fedora and CentOS have this thing called Koji. Um, I don't remember what the Debian infrastructure has, but they've got this elaborate setup to do all this as well. And this is a tool for building an operating system. Um, what's kind of happened recently uh, in the FreeBSD community is a shift towards binary packages. Um, it's always, uh, I shouldn't say always, but for a long time it's had this uh, Perl um, package management suite called uh, pkg underscore add and there were some other associated tools there. 
um, this was not, this was kind of a, a temporary thing. It was supposed to be a temporary thing, and it stuck until about uh, a year or two ago um, when a project called PKGNG took off. Um, this is a proper binary package manager. It's quite similar to uh, apt or yum in terms of features. Um, it's been rapidly maturing. It's very fast, um, and uh, it still uses ports underneath. So when you're running a large deployment like I do at work, you want to build software a certain way. You'll see this. People like Google that are Linux shops are still building all their packages from source. Uh, they happen to be doing it with the Debian toolkit, um, but this is very important when you need to run your own schedule for updates, um, not just for bug fixes, but for features. Um, so FreeBSD makes this all pretty easy, um, and the, the package ng stuff as an end user, you can just hit the upstream binary mirror, um, but as a you know, somebody that's thinking a little bit higher level, you, you still have access to that, that source um, system, and it, it's still encouraged to use that uh, when you need to. Okay, I actually have a follow-up on that. So at the beginning, I might have uh, missed something there. You're talking about just downloading things off the Internet. Towards the end, you said the mirror. Yep. So when you're, when you're downloading, I will have a second portion of it. So you're downloading uh, from wherever you're getting this, this software. So the first question is, where is that? And then the second portion is, do you have uh, GPG fingerprints, et cetera, et cetera, on the software so that you know checksum tells you it hasn't been disturbed, right. but the checksum could have also been um, intercepted. So how do we verify that what you're downloading is actually what was uploaded by the trusted developer? Yeah, so, so the ports tree itself, um, you tend to update either using, uh, there, there's a system called Port Snap that uses um, I'm actually not sure what the back end is. It might be HTTPS, but it's talking to the FreeBSD uh, back end. You can update it over SVN, which uses HTTPS. Um, then you're relying on you know, uh, public key encryption. Okay. And there's also a GitHub mirror uh, that's semi-official. Um, so that, that verifies that your ports tree, your recipes, are authentic. Uh, the ports tree has checksums in it. So these say that the dist files that you're pulling from the upstream are what I expect, what, the, what I as the packager uh, expected when I created that recipe. Um, then there's this third component that's the binary packages that's separate from this stuff, and these are all signed. Uh, the repo is signed similar to, to uh, other operating systems. Okay. Um, a lot of what he said... Uh, about FreeBSD goes for OpenBSD, except for some things. Um, it hasn't diverged all that much. Um, we have these recipes for building packages. So if you try to install a port from source, it actually builds a package and then installs the package, a binary package. Um, so if you were to download that from the official OpenBSD repository, get your binary package from there, it should match one that you built unless you tweak options. Um, you have a handful of, you know, just like Yum or whatever else, you have a handful of options for controlling this stuff. Um, and it's done through make files and uh, a few package commands. Um, They've added signed packages and things like that. Um, it's very easy to do. Another thing that's easy to do is if you want to do things where you tweak the packages and you want that for your company or your everything in your home, it's very easy to set up a repository that gets checked first, a local one. Um, so you check there for packages, and then if you don't find it, then you can go search you know, higher upstream. To go to go there, so even if you have custom packages, you don't have to build it each time for every machine in your company. You just do it. You could have it like an official um, package building machine, and everyone in the company sucks packages off there. It's the same way. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it works. It works pretty pretty well. So if 
speaking of local changes, so let's say I wanted to uh, make a particular change, either that be configuration for how it's built, or I have a particular patch that I want to apply. So for instance, maybe I want to apply uh, um, tell OpenSSH that it should default to port 23 so that I can confuse people who are looking for Telnet, um, and that I want to have a patch that says instead of um, this is open, you know, this is open SSH. It says this is open SSH. Try it if you can inside the code. So it's a one-line patch. Can I have locally basically a patch file, whether that be in the make system and or the code, so that when I download the new new code from the repository, it automatically applies that and, and then compiles with my local changes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how FreeBSD does it. OpenBSD. Um, it's been a few years, but I used to maintain a few packages. Um, it, the package tools make it really easy to do your own packages. So that's how I started out maintaining them. Like, they didn't have a package for Nginx, um, which was just barely beginning to get popular. And I wanted it, so I made it for myself, and I thought, it, well, I've done this, so I'll just submit it. And boom, now I'm a package maintainer. Woo! You know? But like a lot of things in this world, um, you write it on one system, it doesn't compile on something else. Um, unless you're familiar with like a lot of different unices, um, you tend to write toward what you know. It's pretty easy to do stuff. But anyway, to get back to your original question, you have to do a you have to do a patch. You go in, you download the sources. You can make a change right there in the code. Then the package tools in OpenBSD allow you to do a diff that produces the patch, puts it in the right place in the package system, mm -hmm. in the port system. And now you've got the patch done, and it's all reconciled, and it's so. So next, when the new version of Nginx comes out. It'll download the new version from the official repository and try to, to automatically apply your patch. Yeah. And of course, get, if it doesn't automatically apply, it'll give you an error. And there are some advanced ways to deal with that, um, but I'm too dumb to figure them out. So I would like back things out and put the new patch, the new version, and then you know you end up with the same result. I just did it the manual way. The slow learning way. Yeah. Well, there are people who maintain lots and lots of ports. Um, I had a couple. So I did it the, for me, the easy to figure out way, the way I al already knew. So. Okay. Do you have something you want to add, Ken? No. Uh, FreeBSD is pretty much the same. There's, you know, you, you, you can do the drop-in patch files. Um, and this is actually common. If you're a package maintainer, I think this is kind of what you're hinting at. Um, software's written, you know, for the, the author or upstream's preferred operating system. And if that isn't adequate for portability, you probably have to put in some shims. Um, and, and that's common in, in the ports tree. You can find examples of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lots of it. <laughs> All right, so I still have more questions here, but at this point I would like to open it up if, if you've got a question. So in FreeBSD, you have ports, you have a ports option, or you have the uh, package install option. Do you have that in OpenBSD also? Yeah. Um, like what I, what I mentioned before, if you build straight from ports on OpenBSD, it produces a binary package, and then that is installed. Um, there are, there is an official repository of binary packages of the most popular, the most commonly installed um, out there for you to use without having to build stuff yourself. So yes, and that's you know very much like uh, like FreeBSD also has the binary packages available. So let me ask about a uh, specific uh, project, and I actually don't know. Uh, where this came out from, which BSD project, but I know it's uh, it originated with uh, BSD, but uh, CARP. 
description of what it is and what what you use for it, and maybe a little bit about the history, and, and if you know. Okay. Well, CARP is a uh, redundancy protocol, and uh, OpenBSD is even has a song about it, which I encourage you to look up and and listen to because it's it's done in. Um, it's not a Monty Python thing. You you probably don't know. Yeah. Anyway, it's a spoof, and it's funny. Um, but a little bit on the history was, uh, I believe it was Cisco in VRRP. Um, they said it was open, and they got the I IETF involved, but then they wanted to patent parts of it. And so that you couldn't actually really use it without licensing it. Well, now it's an open standard, but it requires you to license it. Now, wait a minute. What's wrong with this picture? Right? Is that open or is it proprietary? Well, they wanted the best of both worlds. So I believe it was OpenBSD that started CARP, which was basically a drop-in replacement for Cisco's VRRP. Um, functionally and uh, it works really well they uh, one of the developers had had the neat demo where he had the alternative things and you've got the network coming through here and he takes out an axe and chops through the network cable while he's streaming music and without missing anything because it buffers just a little bit it takes the alternate path through the other server, which is also able to stream things and reroutes all of that automatically for you. So it's you know it's a nice redundancy setup. And uh, you like unless there was more I needed to say about it. You want? Yeah, I'll take, uh, uh, expand on it a little bit. So um, CARP is a layer two uh, protocol, or uh, it works on layer two. It it, it creates a virtual MAC address, um, so you can share an IP between multiple computers. So this can be used, uh, like Darren was saying, for the your router. Like when you know, I'm sure most of you have set up like a, a, a manual IP where you had to type in the default gateway. Well, if that's a single computer and that goes down, um, you can't get out to the internet. So as you know, systems guys, we want to put up one or more routers, you know, two or more routers actually. Um, so CARP lets you use the same IP on two or more systems, so they can either load balance or take over when the other one goes down. Um, and it uses like an advertisement, so it says, "Yes, I'm up. Yes, I'm up. Yes, I'm up," and uh, that determines the master. Um, or they can flip-flop rapidly to do load balancing. Um, it can also be used for, uh, for like, a, outside of routing, you can use it for, um, for, for like, server load balancing. Um, that's not as common, but that is that's something that can be done with it as well. So I, I mentioned earlier we're a Linux group. Uh, we do have BSD people here, but we also have a lot of influence with the Linux side. And I know that BSD does uh, partitions and file systems a little bit different than we're used to from uh, Linux. So would one of you cover those? So um, yeah, I'll, I, I want to cover the ZFS angle. So <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Well, so FreeBSD um, adopted this file system called ZFS. Uh, ZFS is, has kind of had a, a decent history behind it. It started in 2001 um, at Sun Microsystems. Um, Matt Ahrens and uh, Jeff Bonwick created this file system. Um, it's quite different than every other Unix file system, um, at least the open source ones up until this time. Uh, everything is copy on write. Um, and it's completely atomic, so there's no file system checks. Um, and you can do snapshots where you can freeze the state uh, of the file system and either you know send that off for a backup or revert to it. Um, and FreeBSD, uh, so Sun, sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, Sun open sourced uh, Solaris in 2005. 
and FreeBSD took this code and ported it to their uh, to to our platform in in 2007, um, and it's pretty much the default file system um, for a lot of use cases nowadays in FreeBSD. Um, with that, it has a built-in volume manager. It has a built-in uh, software RAID implementation. Um, it can do transparent compression. It can do deduplication. Um, so it's pretty much the, the kitchen sink. It's it's pretty fantastic. Uh, it changes the way you manage systems if you're not not used to that kind of thing. Um, I think uh, OpenBSD has UFS. As, uh, FreeBSD has this as well. Do you want to talk about that? Or? Hmm. No. So uh, I, I can cover a little <laughs> bit of it. Um, the the UFS file system has roots in the original Unix implementation. Um, in the 80s, a guy named Kirk McCusick wrote this kind of groundbreaking uh, paper on the, the Berkeley Fast File System. Um, and FFS, or uh, it's actually just called UFS uh, for the most part today, um, has a lot of nice properties. Um, it's it's really stood the test of time. This file system is still in use today. Like um, at work, we use this to, to stream videos um, because we want to have a, a file system on every drive. And we when those hard drives die, we don't care. We just take it out of service. We don't want RAID or anything like that slowing down or, or causing complexity in our pipeline. Um, the, the fast file system has kind of... Uh, been able to adopt um, new things in time. Uh, in Linux, there was the uh, you know the primary file system for a long time. When I got involved, was extension two or ext two. Um, then they added journaling in the in the third uh, ext three. Uh, journaling is a way that you can shorten the, the the file system check time if you have a hard crash. Um, and then in the ext4 file system, they added um, extent allocation, uh, which lets you use less inodes for your files. Um, the Berkeley fast file system was able to do all these things without um, dramatic rewrite, um, which is it's kind of a testament to, to McCusick's uh, design. It's, it's a pretty fantastic file system. Um, the current implementation in FreeBSD doesn't um, need a an expensive file system check. It uses a thing called soft updates that um, effectively buffer the writes, so the file system is always consistent on disk. Um, and this is, I'm pretty sure, in OpenBSD as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's been one more recent update. Uh, there's a journaling feature um, with the soft updates. You can still you, your your data is always consistent on the disk, but you can have some unused space. Like if you delete something, that can still take up space. So you have to do this pass. Uh, you have to do a, a fi an, an online file system check. You can be using the system while this is running. Um, there's one more feature called journaling that eliminates that as well. Um, so it's it's basically feature parity with extension for file system in Linux. I'm glad I let you talk about that. You did a I'm, fine job. I'm a file system nerd. <laughs> so you said ZFS is becoming the file system of choice. Is the way that I've seen ZFS used has been more for storage, for you know you've got one machine with a whole bunch of disks on it. But would you also be using ZFS for the root file system? Yes. So FreeBSD has a ZFS bootloader. Um, so you can, you know, even if you have a single disk, like on my laptop, I run ZFS because I want checksumming and I want snapshots and I want to easily back my system up. Um, ZFS takes over. You don't generally need partitioning. Um, the default install will put, uh, you need a small bootloader partition to, to bootstrap this whole thing. Um, but you're, for instance, you generally wouldn't have like a, a, a partition for, for slash home or slash user or anything like that. Okay. You would use the volume management in, in ZFS, which is uh, hierarchical. So you can, you can create, uh, you know, additional layers of, of volume management. 
volume management. Um, in BSD, there, this is because BSD kind of predates um, PCs a little bit. Uh, you don't generally use um, the terminology is different. It, it, it's called uh, slicing a disk uh, rather than partitions, but it's effectively the same uh, same deal. In, in BSD, the, what, as I recall, you basically do the disk partition, so you can create a couple of different partitions on the disk, and then within that you have the slices or the, the actual file system partitions, so you might have uh, whatever BSD calls dev SDA uh, one, but dev SDA one might have slash boot, et cetera, you know, user, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in what the disks counts as one file system, as one partition, but you have multiple file systems in it. Yeah, so the, the slicing is, um, it's not like the, the MVR uh, style partitioning. This stuff got a little bit cleaner in recent times in FreeBSD. We use, um, GPT, uh, which is used by Windows, uh, FreeBSD. I'm not sure if OpenBSD does GPT yet. I don't think so. Okay. Um, but this this is a just like a standard. Uh, it's like the new way to do disk partitioning and handle large disks. Yeah, just from an appliance perspective, since we're talking CFS, I'd like to ask him for someone who's new to BSD. Free NAS or NAS for free? So I haven't actually used NAS for free. I, I don't. I'm not comfortable commenting on it because of that. So um, the latest free NAS, like seven. Oh, I see. So it's the pre fork. So um, free NAS started out um, as a, a project. Somebody I don't know the full history behind it, but it was um, it was derived from the I believe either the PF Sense or Mono Wall code. Um, which uses PHP to do all the web UI and, and configuration. Um, there was a shift in, in FreeNAS uh, a, a, a few years ago where they rewrote the back end in Python and Django. Um, and this was kind of sponsored, and it's basically owned by a company called IX Systems now. Um, so FreeNAS now is... Uh, based on, on those technologies, um, and it's backed by this company. You can get support or, or commercial uh, appliances from them. Um, I think I, I, I've met the IX Systems people, and I, I think they're pretty good folks. Um, I would personally recommend you know using FreeNAS. Um, I'm not sure if if NAS for free, uh, you know what what the activity level is there. If it's still actively maintained or not, I just haven't looked at it. So the the BSD standard license versus the GPL, um, would let one of you like to compare contrast? Um, I can start here anyway. The uh, the BSD license, um, first of all, it may not actually be a BSD license. It may be an MIT license or an ISC license. They're all almost identical with some minor differences and they all basically say the same things which is um, you can do whatever you want with it just don't remove this license and you can you know you can use this to help your grandmother or you can use it to um, as an evil plot to take over the world or um, now we'll leave that one comment off the internet where it belongs on the internet. Um, that is very simple. It's very easy to understand, and it's a philosophical departure from the GPL. Um, which which you favor is up to you and what you think is good. The GPL, on the other hand, says you can use this as long as you agree to maintain um, you know the the set of the set of things that we want to be able to propagate when this code goes out there. Um, BSD licenses do not say that. They say you can take this and put it into a closed up product that you sell. Um, you know the uh, 
the nice thing is that there can be some cooperation between these two camps, like you can take BSD code and put it in the Linux kernel. No harm done, it's still GPL'd because of all the surrounding GPL. That little bit of code is BSD code, doesn't hurt anybody. Um, so if somebody were to take the license, you know, the the big chunk of GPL code with a little chunk of BSD code in it, that doesn't give them an out or anything. They still have to abide by the GPL if they want to use this, if they want to distribute this big chunk of code. And if they wanted to take the little BSD part, well, they could have got it where it came from originally. So <laughs> there's, you know, there's no harm there. Um, Anything you would like to add to that? I have a joke I heard from McKusick. Um, AT&T had copyright of Unix. The Free Software Foundation had copy left. The BSD folks said, take everything to the copy center. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's really kind of our philosophy. Just We want people to use our stuff. Um, if they want to give back, you know, that's their... their uh, you know their intentions, but we're not requiring you to do anything. And, and philosophically, I really like that. Yeah, I would like to bring up too that there are obviously some high-profile cases of companies, proprietary companies, taking BSD code. Um, there was a time for a while when Microsoft's TCP/IP stack was OpenBSD. So open oh, their TCP IP stack. Um, Theo, as you some of you may know, he's like contentious, uh, foul mouth, son of a gun. He's totally okay with that. It's a better world if the internet is a safer place because they're using tried and tested code in Windows compared to some of the other stuff you could find in Windows, at least their TCP IP stack for that period of time is solid. Um, uh, Max used largely FreeBSD user land with their own mock kernel. Good. If I use a Mac, I'm in fairly familiar ground. I'm thankful that they didn't feel the need to reinvent all of this stuff and give us yet another set of things to know, something weird like AIX or HPUX, you know, at least it's a nice, solid thing, um, you know, from BSD. Glad to see it. Makes the world a slightly better place. I so. think uh, I'm sure a number of people here have Android phones, and these use the Linux kernel, but the C library is largely OpenBSD based, and Google actually contributes. I saw them posting on OpenBSD's mailing list. That's kind of cool. Um, and they're, they're doing that for certain reasons. They're nice properties of that library and the license and everything. Now, it's, this is uh, going back a few years, but I know a, a few years ago there, was, there were some firewall changes in BSD land. Um, so maybe give us an update on what firewalls are in use now and uh, if they're different between the different BSDs? Um, well, for OpenBSD, the answer for many, many, many years has been PF. Um, PF is a firewalling system that I just, I love. It's wonderful. The syntax is much easier to deal with than a lot of others. Um, and it's very rock solid, and it's done nothing but get better and better through the years. Um, it has a lot of advanced features. If you can do it in Linux, you can do it in PF. Um, and almost totally vice versa, but there are some things you can do in PF that are really difficult to do in Linux. Not that you can't, and professionals do all the time. But uh, some things are really convenient and really easy to set up in PF. Um, and uh, if you have any, I, I know FreeBSD has PF also. Yeah, um, so FreeBSD actually has three firewalls, which is kind of unfortunate. <laughs> it's definitely not 
the Unix way to do things. Um, or the, the, the kind of original one is called uh, IP filter, I believe, and this was like an independent project. It runs on a ton of different operating systems. Um, then there's a native FreeBSD firewall called IPFW, um, and it's pretty good. There's some nice properties to it, um, but FreeBSD also has the, the PF firewall, which is also my favorite, um, and I think that's pretty common. Most people, once you touch PF, you're like, wow, everything else is awful um, because the syntax is so nice and it uses a config file versus... Um, typing commands additively to, to set your states up, your rules and states up. Um, unfortunately, the, the FreeBSD version of PF is a little bit out of date. I think it corresponds to, like, OpenBSD 4.8, and, and OpenBSD's done a lot of good stuff to PF in the meantime. Um, it's actually pretty hard to port, uh, even though, you know, FreeBSD and OpenBSD come from a similar... Uh, root, um, they've diverged a lot, and, and FreeBSD is really focused on uh, SMP scalability, so like on your multi-core or multi-socket servers. Um, a lot of work has gone into that, and that makes it harder uh, to bring code in from OpenBSD, who has some different philosophies on these things. Um, FreeBSD has kind of updated the PF version they have to be uh, multi-core scal scalable, but unfortunately that makes it even harder to bring in these nice features that have, have recently landed in OpenBSD. Um, so this is this is an open concern, and, and I would like to see um, the FreeBSD community kind of address this and, and see what we can do to stay closer in line with OpenBSD. Yeah, and I'd love to see OpenBSD make it a little easier, but I don't know that that's coming any time. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a non-trivial problem. I mean, yeah. you're, you're porting kernel code between um, things that have diverged. And it's, it's really, uh, you know, it, it digs into a lot of the internals of the OS. It's not uh, something that can easily be abstracted. Okay. Um, so I'm presuming PFSense is using PF, hence the name? Yes, so, so PFSense is, um, it's, essentially a distribution of FreeBSD. Um, it underneath uses the PF firewall, but there's a nice GUI uh, and, and web UI wrapped around all of the configuration. Um, so if you're comfortable setting up like a Linksys router, you can just jump on a PFSense box and, and be productive. Um, whereas to do PF from scratch, you, you're going to have to do a little bit of reading uh, to figure out the syntax and everything. Um, but there's a, a ton of power from that. You know, you can automate things with the, the config files, and you get a true sense of what's going on when you drop down to that level. And then uh, you mentioned both of you mentioned that the two projects have diverged. Um, so I don't know if we you covered in the beginning. I don't remember it covered how old the projects are, kind of speak, kind of, and how long ago they've they've diverged, um, and maybe where in the tree they diverged from. Um, I can start with a little bit of ancient history. So um, BSD stands for Berkeley Software Distribution. Um, it was a project that uh, got started at the uh, UC Berkeley. Um, they had like a research group that would um, kind of amass patches and develop software and then send out tapes based on AT&T's Unix uh, source code. Um, and originally, to use it, you had to have an, a, a license from AT&T. And this was like $1,000 or something. Maybe it was like $50,000 uh, later on, um, which wasn't that much for like institutions. But if you were like a smaller company or an individual, that's not a good deal. Um, so they started replacing the code and, and re-implementing everything from scratch to get rid of all the AT&T code. Um, and this was released as uh, net, I, I think it was called net slash two in the, the early 90s. Um, AT&T wasn't very fond of this, and they launched a, a, a lawsuit that really caused some damage to BSD. Um, and this is kind of when Linus came around and, and created uh, the Linux kernel based on some, some things he didn't like about Minix. 
Um, so while this lawsuit was going on, um, the Berkeley uh, Research Group shut down, and there were some people um, that created a thing called 386 BSD where they ported this code to uh, Intel PCs that were catching on, you know, that, that we, we have today. Um, they kind of lost interest. I'm not sure uh, the entire history there, but um, and then a, a, a proper project was set up by a number of people uh, called FreeBSD where they started doing um, collecting these patches and then pushing out releases. And I believe that was 93 or 94 when, 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 when FreeBSD got its proper start. Okay, so a couple decades? <clears throat> yeah. Um, you can look up online and there's this big hairy chart of where all of this stuff comes from and they pulled code in later from like Net3 and Net4 and all of this stuff and it gets mishmashed. Um, but basically, after that, after the 3, 386 BSD stuff, um, then there was the, in addition to the free BSD, there was net BSD, um, which was a lot the same but a little bit different uh, history. You know, it started up right after FreeBSD, I believe. I, I think it actually might have been before. Hmm. But the the, the FreeBS the FreeBSD people were so adamant about PC they didn't really yeah. care about the the other stuff where the yeah. net guys wanted very PC the widespread. Yeah. Right, and then. Um, NetBSD went along for a little while, and Theo, uh, Theo Durat of OpenBSD was actually part of the FreeBSD team. They had a falling out, and so he went over and started OpenBSD. Um, and that was, you know, that was all in the 90s, and that, uh, that gives us some time to diverge those three main things. We won't even bring up all the other little ones like Dragonfly. Um, but everyone still keeps into the, what you might think of, you you might uh, be familiar with like, you know, the Unix philosophy. Well, in addition to that, there's kind of a BSD philosophy. And so while there might be a lot of divergence and a lot of like, I don't like the way these guys are doing it or whatever. There's still a lot of uh, adherence to the BSD way of doing things, which is like the Unix philosophy plus a little extra with a couple of amendments. Um, and it's generally a good way of doing things. I started out with FreeBSD back in the... I don't know, what, like 96 or 97, something like that. I'd never touched it before. I'd only used Linux. And I went to work as a sysadmin using FreeBSD, and it's like, this is good stuff. <laughs> and that's where I got my introduction to it. Um, and it's, it's like really like you don't miss a beat. It's a very similar feel um, to all of all of them. The only one I haven't used is really I, I've installed NetBSD, but I haven't really. There's used regularly it. code uh, sharing between the projects, um, and you know they're they're not hostile really towards each other. They're, it's it's just kind of different philosophies and different goals. Um, you can it, there there's similarities to Linux distributions, um, a little bit more severe than that, but it, you you can think of them somewhat somewhat similar to different distributions. So you're talking about they've they diverged 20 years ago, you're still sharing, but you now have the OpenBSD kernel and the FreeBSD kernel that, while they can still borrow from each other, are actually different trees and have been separating for 20 years. Versus the Linux distributions, we're all using the same kernel, and particular releases might have different because of the release cycle and there's slight differences. So Red Hat applies different third-party patches than SUSE or Debian or what, what have you. But they're still coming back recently to the same tree within the last, you know, usually three to six months or something like that. Um, 
So are there any other notable things you think via whether that be how they're, they're built and how they're maintained or feature-wise um, that you see between uh, BSD and Linux? So I would actually argue that the, the BSD way of bringing uh, an operating system together is superior um, because you have a kernel plus a user land. Um, Linux is simply a kernel, and it's a very good kernel, but it's up to all these distributions to go and grab this grab bag of stuff and, and turn that into a useful system. And that's not consistent between the, the different distributions, um, despite, you know, uh, what you might think. Um, for instance, like on, you know, the, the Android platform is quite a bit different than what you run on a laptop. Um, even though they're using the Linux kernel, the, the upper half of that is, is quite a lot different. Um, in BSD, you get a consistent uh, environment. So when you install it, you have a kernel and user land that talk to each other. You know, they, they, if you need to make a change in the kernel, you can, you can do things in a breaking fashion um, because you update the, the user side at the same time. Um, in Linux, the, the, the Linux kernel developers have to be very careful about backwards compatibility. They have to make sure that they don't break any of their uh, APIs because that would cause havoc to all of these people building on top of, the, of, of that kernel. Um, so this lets BSD evolve, in my opinion, in a nicer fashion. Um, there's, I'm sure you can find plenty of people that, that, would, that can argue the other side. It's just a, a personal taste. With that, so you're talking about the for Android, where you've got the Linux kernel and then the, the BSD libc on top of it. Um, but would we not be able to say the same thing about the Mac, the Apple phone, which is the BSD underneath, but then the Apple uh, user land on top? So Apple's doing the same thing that FreeBSD and OpenBSD are doing. They're giving you a, a, an operating system. Um, they take their mock kernel and their user land, and they ship that as a single unit. So it's always consistent. You never get out of touch between the kernel and the, 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 the top half. Okay. Well, um, it, it can diverge from everybody else, but it's always consistent with itself. Okay. So we're, we still have that for the distribution. So Google is essentially doing that for Android, being the, the single source of truth aside from CyanogenMod and everything, but they're still being based on that single distribution in the end. Um, and you could have different distributions. Um, but it sounds like what you're saying is that in the in BSD, that userland is being developed by the same people who are developing the kernel at the same time. That's the, Whereas, the key. Yeah. The key yeah. win in my it, it, it's actually why I think BSD has a lot fewer people working on it, but it's generally able to keep up with other operating systems. Um, as an example of some of the pains of this, like um, at work. Um, we run uh, Ubuntu, and we use DRVD for these databases. And if you update the kernel, you might change that API that the user land tools touch to, to configure the kernel. Um, because the people, the, the Ubuntu packagers weren't, for whatever reason, managing that well. Um, that kind of thing just won't happen on BSD. When you do an update, you get the kernel and the, the user land uh, components in sync at the same time. Okay. Yeah, DRBD is a little special in its own way. Um, but I know that part of their issue is working with different kernels and uh, different distributions being in different points. And that made it, made it more difficult for them. Yeah, so the, the, just, it just, the distributions can, can do this stuff for you. Um, Red Hat does a pretty good job of, of keeping everything in sync and, and consistent through their life cycle. But they, I mean, it's hard work. They're, they're putting in some sweat to, to make that happen. Um, because the FreeBSD, or the, the, all the BSDs do this converged development, um, I think it's just a little bit more efficient. Um, but again, this is taste. This is not fact. Okay. Well, it's it's not just taste. There are pros and cons to each way of doing it. Um, so, which pros you want and which cons you're allowed, you know, you can feel you can live with, may dictate which work best for you. Um, 
you know, I'm the same as Kevin. I, you know, my, for me, I would, I like the whole, the whole operating system um, philosophy. And in addition to, uh, in, in addition to just the packages themselves, um, OpenBSD, and I'm sure FreeBSD too, they maintain the man pages. That's actually like a thing that they do. So you don't go and look up, you don't go out to a website to figure out what to do. You read the man page because the man page is maintained. What? You made a change in the code? Fix the man page. Bat. Or it doesn't go in. I'm not taking this. I'm not taking this patch. Fix the man page. The whole this whole philosophy is kind of about internal consistency, be it you know the kernel, the documentation, the user land. It's all it's all this continuous cycle that evolves at the same time, and it's it's got some nice properties that I, I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. Ed, I think. A good example might be the uh, uh, deprecating uh, uh, APIs uh, in OpenBSD that. Uh, Queuing uh, code in PF was recently uh, changed significantly, and and still there aren't any uh, coordination issues between uh, user land and the chain in the firewall. Um, as long as you're in that particular version. So, do you know about the time change they did recently? This is really extreme. Like, they they made a fundamental change to their their the way their operating system works um, the way it tracks time um, yeah. and users for the most part don't really I mean they can be oblivious to this but um, it, it's really neat I mean that you can do stuff like that and correct you know faults that, that need to be fixed yeah, they uh, I was talking about the the 64-bit time. So oh, like yeah yeah they switched to sixty four bit yeah they, like no just as a, a background so Unix systems if you use a thirty two bit counter for epic time um, will actually run out the counter will wrap in two thousand thirty eight this was the same very similar to the Y two K bug where if you had a two digit date code and it wraps that's a big deal um, the OpenBSD guy said, even on 32-bit systems, which are going to be in production for a long time in industrial roles or whatever, we're going to we're just going to make 64-bit time the thing everywhere. And they went ahead and and uh, reworked their their kernel and their user land um, and pushed this out as a unit in one of their updates. And now nobody has to worry about the the 2038 problem on OpenBSD. Well, that was not. Financially thinking the future, they could have been making a lot, a lot of money in 2037. <laughs> All right. Um, and the example uh, from the audience was uh, PF Sense needed to make a change, and they were able to uh, do that change both in the kernel, so PF being uh, uh, the firewall, which is inherently uh, has a lot to do with the kernel, uh, but also in the user land, they could walk that change through both systems together so that you continue working. Uh, and then I have. Uh, uh, one final question, unless I have follow-ups. Um, so we're talking about both, mostly talking about BSD, but I mentioned that we do a lot of Linux here. Um, so would one of you want to cover um, security in depth, where you might want to use multiple versions of BSD or BSD and Linux together, and uh, some advantages uh, for doing something like that? Um, I can start, and you probably have lots to talk about with that, too. Um, and security in depth is just uh, what it sounds like. It's uh, it's in depth. A lot of people get confused. I've actually seen people do that. They say, in order to make to give the hackers grief, I'm going to have like a commercial firewall and a Linux firewall and an OpenBSD firewall, all of them public facing. That's breadth, that's not depth. That means I've got the keys to one of these with a zero day. You buy the whole thing, you get in. It's like having a whole row of doors on the front of your house with a whole bunch of different kinds of locks on each door. It's like, I know how to pick that one. You get into the house. You don't do that. Instead, you stack the doors up one after the other. 
So I know how to pick this door and you open it. Oh, great, another door, and I don't know how to pick that lock. That's just the basic idea. So you can put, if you have a whole, you know, you have a whole farm full of Linux servers, um, pick something different for your firewall. Have two firewalls. Um, go ahead and have a Linux one, have an open BSD one or a free BSD one. Um, you know, and then if you have like failover servers both running Postgres, maybe you could put them on different operating system. Somebody puts, uh, somebody breaks in and does some kind of a, a denial of service against your Postgres thing, maybe one system goes down, the other one stays up, and your failover works. Um, that kind of thing, having, you know, getting away from a complete monoculture is a nice idea. I know there are at least one or two people in here who do some of this themselves. They're here at the Linux group. They use Linux. They love Linux. And they have a BSD box out there. I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, monoculture is very dangerous. There's this, it, it, if you've written software, you kind of quickly overcome, like, a lot of cognitive bias. <laughs> but there's this, um, there's this perception, like, well, if everybody just worked on the same thing, it would be super extra awesome. But, like, in reality, it's, if you, if you're all working on the same thing and you start veering off the wrong course, there's nobody left to keep doing the right thing. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. I like, I like Linux. I use Linux as well. Um, but I, I'm really supportive of what the FreeBSD folks do. I think they've got some great ideas and I, I love supporting them when I can. Um, you know, I've got to take a stab at System D. I don't like the design of it. Um, <laughs> and guess what? You know, when I'm on my FreeBSD boxes, I just don't have to think about that. And I, and I like that a lot. Um, but, you know, maybe those guys are doing something good that I don't see yet, and they're going to keep going down that path, and they, they have the opportunity to prove that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good so, luck to them on that, right? So, they, they, you know, there's a lot to be said about some diversity, um, and, you know, sometimes it's security, uh, sometimes it's uh, architectural bugs, sometimes it's just people, you know, doing the wrong thing. Um, so I, I think... You know, you, you've got to have an open mind uh, to these things. It's it's not uh, Boolean. Kevin, I think you were giving me an example of a root server. Oh, root servers? sure. So um, as, a, as a fantastic example of this, um, I got to go to a conference at, uh, hosted by VeriSign. Um, they are in the business of running the com net and the trailing dot root servers for uh, the internet. Um, the com and net uh, is basically a monopoly. The ICANN says, we're going to outsource running this stuff to you, but you can't screw it up. You've got to have essentially an 100% uptime, um, which if you've ever worked in like systems engineering is crazy. Um, so everything they do is you know pretty hardcore to, to make sure that that system's resilient. And they do, like Darren was saying, you know, they run different firewalls. Um, they run different operating systems, uh, Linux and, and FreeBSD primarily these days. And in doing so, they, they can kind of insulate themselves from, you know, a, a, a single problem that, that could wipe out their entire infrastructure. Um, and, and that's, you know, a nice, a nice thing. If you can do something like that, you've got, you've got an infrastructure you can be proud of. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up here. Uh, so I want to say, first of all say thanks again to Darren and Kevin for coming and, and participating in the panel for us.